John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave While weep the sons of bondage whom he ventured all to save But though he sleeps his life was lost while struggling for the slave His soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah glory, Welcome glory, hallelujah. to War of the Rebellion Stories of the Civil War. I am your host, Leon, and this is a reading of The History, Reminiscence of the 19th Massachusetts Regiment, by Captain John G. B. Adams. Chapter 5 Battles at Peach Orchard, Glendale, and Malvern Hill Company A had in its ranks men of every trade and profession, not excepting the clergy. Our minister might have been a good soldier in the army of the Lord, but was not a success in the army of the Potomac. At the first fire he scattered and could not be rallied. I said to him, "'You have been telling the boys to get ready to die.' but you are not in good marching order for the other shore yourself. That is not it, replied Levy. I should not have enlisted. It always made me nervous to hear a gun fired, and I don't believe I can get used to it. As will be shown later, he never did. Returning to our works, we were ordered to throw up traverses between companies. At night, cheering began on our right. An aide rode down the line and gave orders to Colonel Hinks to have the regiment cheer. "'What for?' said the colonel. "'I do not know,' was the reply. "'It is orders from General McClellan to General Dana. "'Give my compliments to General Dana "'and say that we did our cheering in front of the line yesterday.' Soon we were ordered to pack up and leave everything not absolutely necessary to carry. We were ordered into line and remained under arms all night. The next morning we found the retreat had begun, and, before we had recovered from our surprise, were ordered in to support Tompkins Rhode Island Battery, and the enemy was soon upon us. At the headquarters of the Commissary Department, all was confusion. A pile of hardtack as large as Fanul Hall was set on fire. Heads of commissary whiskey barrels were knocked in, and the whiskey ran in streams. This was also set on fire, and men were burned as they tried to drink it. Blankets, clothing, stores of all kinds were destroyed, and one would think, as an army, we were going out of business. But such was not the case as we had enough on our hands to last us the next seven days. We made a stand at Peach Orchard, and found that our corps was to cover the retreat of the army. We were slowly driven back to Savage Station, where a battery went in position, and we lay in the rear as its support. One who has never supported a battery can form no idea of this duty, which is to lie just as snug to the ground as you can and take those shells coming from the enemy that the battery does not want. Our position at Savage was a dangerous one. Shells were constantly bursting in our ranks, and our battery was being severely tested. It did not seem that our lines could be held much longer, yet we knew that our wagon train was crossing the bridge and we must stand our ground until they were safely over. We heard a cheer, and looking to the left saw Meagher's Irish Brigade moving forward on the run. The entire corps, forgetful of danger, sprang to their feet and cheered them wildly. On they went, grape and canister plowed through their ranks, but they closed up the gaps and moved on up to the mouth of the rebel batteries, whose guns were captured, and the firing that had been so disastrous ceased. The Irish Brigade held the line until night, when our army was withdrawn. 
It was the hottest day of the year. As we changed front, many fell from sunstroke. Captain Wass was so badly affected that he had lost his reason and never fully recovered. Lieutenant Hume was left by the roadside, and was soon captured by the enemy. At night we were stationed at the bridge until the last regiment was over, when we crossed and destroyed the bridge. After we had rested a few hours we were ordered back, and sunrise found us engaged with the enemy. In the afternoon the terrible battle of Glendale was fought. This was June 30th. About 2 o'clock p.m., we were ordered to charge the enemy, who were in a belt of woods. To do this, we must charge over an open field. Faces turned pale as we looked over the ground. We grasped our muskets firmer and waited for the order. We had kept our knapsacks until this time. They had become priceless treasures, filled as they were with little articles for our comfort made by loving hands and with letters from dear ones at home. But we threw them into a pile, and the voice of Colonel Hinks was heard. Forward, double quick. And we moved across the field and entered the woods. Here we met a line clothed in Union blue, and thinking it was the 7th Michigan of our brigade, a regiment loved by every officer and man of the 19th, we reserved our fire, and cried, don't fire, boys. We are the 19th Massachusetts. A galling fire in our face drove us back, but we promptly moved forward again, still thinking it was the 7th Michigan, and that they would see their mistake. Again we were repulsed, and believing we were mistaken, and that the line was composed of rebels in our uniform, we charged with a will. As they rose to receive us, we saw that this time we were not mistaken as they were rebels clothed in part in our uniforms. We had a hand-to-hand -hand fight for a few moments, when we discovered that we were being flanked and withdrew to the edge of the woods. Under a terrible fire we changed front. Our brave Major Howe fell, never to rise again. Colonel Hinks was supposed to be mortally wounded and was carried from the field. Lieutenant David Lee was killed, and the ground was strewn with our dead and wounded comrades. For a moment, the regiment was in confusion. But Captain Weymouth, assisted by Sergeant Major Newcomb and others, rallied the men on the colors, and the line was at once reformed and our position held. Captain Edmund Rice was in command of the regiment. He was noted for his coolness and bravery and the men had confidence in him. As I looked down the line of Company A, many places were vacant. Ed Hale, Volney P. Chase, Charles Boynton, and several others were killed, while the list of wounded could not be ascertained at that time. Company A had lost men by death, but this was the first time any of our number had been killed in action. Charles Boynton was one of my townsmen. He was an eccentric man, and had troubled Captain Merritt by his peculiar ideas of drill. But he was as brave and patriotic a man as ever shouldered a musket. He had no patience with the slow movements of the army, and I have often heard him say that he wanted to fight every day and close up the job. When advancing in line, he would constantly rush ahead of the company, his only desire being to get a shot at the rebels. I do not think it would be showing disrespect to his memory, should I relate one or two of the little dialogues between Captain Merritt and Boynton. Our regiment had a peculiar drill in the manual. It was formulated by Colonel Devereux, and is nearly what is used by the army today. After loading, we stood with our little finger on the head of the rammer until the order was given to shoulder arms. One day on drill, Captain Merritt looked down the line and saw Boynton with his hand by his side. 
put your little finger on the head of the rammer, Boynton, sang out Captain Merritt. I won't do it, replied Boynton. Won't do it? Why not? Because it is all nonsense. My gun is loaded. And do you suppose I would stand up and battle like a darned fool with my little finger on the head of my rammer? No, sir. I propose to drill just as I intend to fight. Another day, the order was, Right shoulder, shift arms. The proper way was to make three motions, but Boynton did it in one. Make three motions, Boynton, said Captain Merritt. Didn't I get my gun on my shoulder as quick as any man in the company, was the reply. Captain Merritt was discouraged, and ordered me to punish Boynton. But I exclaimed his peculiarities, and assured the captain that he would earn his thirteen dollars a month when fighting began. He let the matter drop. Had the Union Army been composed entirely of men like Charles Boynton, the war would have ended long before it did. We held our position until midnight. It was the saddest night I ever spent. The dead and wounded of both armies lay between the lines. The wounded were constantly calling on their comrades for water, and we could hear calls for Mississippi, Georgia, and Virginia, mingled with those for Michigan, New York, and Massachusetts. Brave men from our regiment crawled over the field, giving water to friend and foe alike. About midnight, the order was whispered down the line to move. I had been from right to left of the company, keeping the men awake, as we expected the order. As still as possible, we crawled over the field. We had gone but a short distance when, looking back, I saw one member of the company had not started. Thinking he had fallen asleep, I returned, and shaking him, said, Come, come. As I drew close to him, my eyes rested on the face of Jonathan Hudson, cold in death. He had been killed in the early evening as we lay in line, and his death was not known to his comrades near him. It was the saddest sensation I ever experienced. When we arrived at the road, we found many of our wounded. Colonel Hinks was on a stretcher, and as the ambulances were full, he was carried a long distance before one could be found. Captain Devereux was also badly wounded, and had to be carried. We started with the body of Major Howe, and a blanket as we had no stretchers. But being so very heavy, we were forced to leave him. Without any regimental formation, we began our weary march to Malvern Hill, where we arrived at daylight, were at once ordered to support a battery, and witnessed one of the most terrible artillery battles of the war. In the afternoon, our brigade was ordered to the woods and held the right of the army. The next morning, in a drenching rain, we started for Harrison's Landing. We marched in three lines, but it was not an army. It was a mob. Artillery was stuck in the mud. Wagons were abandoned and burned by the roadside. The only thought of everyone was to get to Harrison's Landing as soon as possible. Some did not stop at the landing, but took boats for Washington. Among these was our minister, Levi. He had managed to keep out of every battle, and now deserted, joining the advanced guard in Canada. Harrison's Landing, when dry, was a sandy plain. When we arrived, it was a sea of mud. Without shelter, overcoats or blankets we dropped in the mud. And being so exhausted, having been without sleep, except the little naps caught in line of battle, for seven days, we soon forgot our misery. 
and was two days before we could reorganize our companies. Men were coming in who we expected were killed or captured. But July 4th, upon calling the roll, we found that more than half of the men who had left Massachusetts with us less than a year before had either been killed in battle, died of disease, or were sick or wounded in General Hospital. The death rate at Harrison's Landing was fearful. Men who had stood the retreat now broke down and soon died. Every hour in the day we could hear the dead march, as comrade after comrade was laid at rest. The subject for discussion around the campfire was the disaster to the Union Army. Newspapers called it an important change of base. We knew that someone had been outgeneraled, and all the men had confidence in General McClellan. We believed that while we had been digging and dying before Yorktown, we should have been advancing and fighting. Looking at the campaign, in the most charitable light possible, the fact remained that on April 4th, the finest army ever mustered began the advance on Richmond. That we had been within five miles of that city, and that July 4th found the army on the banks of the James River with less than half of the number it had three months before, we were not disheartened. Many had expected that 1862 would see the end of the war, but it now looked as though those who were spared would see the end of their three years' enlistment. The losses in officers had been such that many promotions were made. Four enlisted men were promoted second lieutenants, and I was one of the number. I was assigned to Company I, Captain J. F. Plimpton. By a misunderstanding between Colonel Hinks and Lieutenant Colonel Devereux, First Sergeant Driver and myself did not receive our commissions until August, although we continued as acting second lieutenants. By the two commissioned by recommendation of Colonel Hanks not being assigned to duty. It was impossible to obtain officers' uniforms, so I bought a pair of brass shoulder straps, sewed them on my well-worn blouse, borrowed a sword of Lieutenant Mumford, and went on duty. As Verdun an officer as could be found in the Army of the Potomac. About the middle of August, I was ordered to report to First Lieutenant John P. Reynolds for special duty. We were to take charge of the guard of the division wagon train that was ordered to Fortress Monroe. Our duty was an important one. We knew we were liable to attack at any time by guerrillas, and constant vigilance was required. We often met small parties of mounted citizens who rode past our train. We believed they were taking us in, but we had not arrived at that time when men were arrested on suspicion, so we let them pass but kept our train well covered. We arrived at Fortress Monroe in due time, turned over the train, and reported to the regiment at Newport News. They having marched a few days after, we were ordered away. While our duty as the advanced guard had been arduous, we had not suffered as much as those who marched with the regiment. They had marched rapidly over dusty roads, under a broiling sun, and many had been sunstruck. Among the number was Captain William A. Hill. He was not able to speak above a whisper for several days, and his condition was serious. But his courage was good and he remained on duty with the regiment. The men having rested a day, and being now veteran soldiers, had forgotten their hardships, and when we arrived were nearly all in the James River hunting for oysters. On August 24th, the brigade embarked on the steamship Atlantic for Washington, arriving at Alexandria the 28th, just one year from the day we left Massachusetts. Chapter 6 
Battles of Fairfax Courthouse, Flint Hill, and Antietam. Which is what we will cover next week. Let's get into some show notes. We have some pretty interesting things to go over, I think. So, he talks about explicitly having cannonballs just shot at him and having to just sit there and lay on the ground. I've read a couple of, in a couple of different books, Union veterans talking about being shelled by artillery and kind of how boring it is and how easy it is to kind of move out of the way. That is not to say that I'm discounting artillery because cannonballs be cannonballs, right? <laughs> and there's a reason why Napoleon loved them so much because they can be highly effective. So, but I I just want to make a note that when he's talking about that, uh, he doesn't really mention a whole lot about casualties. So, don't know. I have, I get conflicting reports where some were like, artillery was boring. I hated when I was getting shot at because I always had to just move out of the way. And then other times like this, he's like, the shells were exploding all around us. So, wide range of experience, it would seem, when it comes to being shot at with artillery. And of course... Things like grape shot and and canister gonna have you know sucks to get hit by that. So, but I just wanted to talk about that. Is you know really focus on what these guys talk about when they're talking about their artillery. One of the things that I've noticed is that some people are bad artillery shots, and uh, it really it really shows. And sometimes they're really good. So. Also really exciting is the charge of the Irish Brigade. Oh, man. What a sight that must have been to see that. That must have been crazy. And the way he describes it, where they're moving forward on the run, and they just sweep right through the grape and canister that plowed through their ranks and capture the artillery. Gosh darn. Thank goodness for the Irish Brigade, right? So, moving on. The way he talks about the retreat during the seven days battle, which is constantly moving, constantly being exhausted, constantly firing and fighting. I don't think we see that again until Grant does it after the Battle of the Wilderness and it's on the drive to Richmond, which kind of shows between the two generals about really pressing the troops. It spooked McClellan. And and vice versa, Grant doing it to Lee kind of spooked him a little bit. But, you know, great generals always have that drive to keep fighting um, and keep their boys moving. So something that's taught regularly now. We call it modern day terms, violence of action. As long as you move with speed and quickness and violence, you'll always have the upper hand. And, you know. Before, when you'd get ambushed, it would be like, hey, like, try and get out of the ambush area. Now, you just directly assault whoever's ambushing you, because you're just going to be more violent than they are, even though that they're ambushing you. So it's uh, it's something that is really interesting to read as uh, we go along in these in these books and these histories, talking about what's happening in their combat. A lot of the little nuggets to modern combat are are scattered all around these histories. I find it very interesting, especially when you go through all of the modern training now. It is all built on the heaps of all this wounded and dead soldiers. Man, just wild. When they think the rebels are their own friendly troops and instead they get blasted twice in the face. Oh, man. Oh, that sucks. It makes my heart go out to them so bad. But... They must have been furious when they realized. And I imagine there was some dudes that met a quick end on the Confederate Confederate side once they clashed together. But, well, anyway. Mr. Boynton, who is a soldier that they're just having all sorts of problems with. And he's like, I'm not dealing with Emmanuel. I'm <laughs> I'm going to do it the e like the fast way because I'm going to be under fire. He specifically says, I propose to drill just as I intend to fight. And that is how it is done now. 
you train how you fight. And Boynton, you were a hundred years ahead of your time because that is exclusively how it's done now. There is no fake training. It is all trained exactly how you're going to fight. And exactly how you're going to fight is how you train. So good on you. I'm sorry you were born in the wrong time. Oh, man, poor guy. Of course, spending the night on the, the battlefield where he talks about all of the different wounded calling from their different states. Heartbreaking. Man, Civil War is just not fun. But I I like how I don't like it's very interesting how he talks very small. There's a very small sentence that just describes the Battle of Malvern Hill. We were ordered to support a battery and witnessed one of the most terrible artillery battles of the war. Sounds like he just watched Lee's boys just get wiped because that's all the Battle of Malvern Hill was, was Lee attacking head on against, you know, an enemy on a hill. We know how that works. It almost hardly ever works in the Civil War. I Only a handful of times, I think. And this is one of his first big mistakes that he makes as a general. So, of course, by the description that we're given in this, it doesn't sound like the Army of the Potomac is, at least for their regiment, is in any way really to start fighting anymore. They've lost their knapsacks. They're, they've been burning their food and their whiskey and their wagons and all sorts of stuff. So they get to Harrison's Landing, and it sounds like it's just a mess. The first thing when I was reading that it reminded me of is it sounded like the Battle of Dunkirk with all of the British soldiers just kind of like sitting there on the beach trying to get out. Sounds exactly like what had happened here, just, you know, 80 years in the past. But here we also arrive to him being promoted to an officer. So now we know how he became captain. Everybody was dead and they needed more guys. So uh, that's just always how it happens, I suppose. And uh, he's headed back to Washington. So we'll find out what happens. Of course, he talks about the Battle of Fairfax Courthouse and Flint Hill and Tietam are next. We will cover that next week. Thank you for listening. Thanks for being here. I'm, I'm so thankful that I have so many listeners now. It's just it's incredible that you guys always want to listen to me. And as we cover these histories, I don't ever planning on stopping. So uh, <laughs> thanks for coming along on this crazy ride. Also, patrons. You are going to be getting prizes now. So, to one patron, Douglas, check your email. You have two tickets to go see Lincoln's in Springfield. Check your email. Get back to me. Let's get you out there, buddy. And of course, to my other patrons, as we move along in this, we're going to be giving away books. Uh, we're going to be doing... Um, get togethers, all sorts of stuff. So if you're a patron, you, uh, you get some cool benefits and that's just how it works. So, uh, come join us on Patreon links in the description below and, uh, I'll see you guys around. Thanks for listening. Have a great one. And bye-bye. Old John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave While weep the sons of bondage whom he ventured all to save But though he sleeps his life was lost while struggling for the slave His soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah Hallelujah, for his soul is marching on. John Brown was a hero, undaunted, true, and brave. And Kansas knew his valor when he fought her rights to save. And now, though the grass grows green above his grave, his soul is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Soul is marching.
marching on He captured Harper's Ferry with his 19 men so few and frightened old Virginie till she trembled through and through. They hung him for a traitor, themselves a traitorous crew. But a soul is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. For a soul. Marching on John Brown was John the Baptist Of the Christ we are to see Christ who of the bondmen Shall the liberator be And soon throughout the sunny south The slaves shall all be free For a soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah For a soul is marching on That he heralded, he looked from heaven to view On the army of the Union With its flag red, white, and blue And heaven shall sing with anthems Or the deed they mean to do For his soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Then strike while strike ye may The death blow of oppression In a better time and way The dawn of old John Brown Has brightened in the day And his soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah Marching on, for his soul is marching.